Every night, when I went to bed, my mom read me a story. My mom, who was back then a young, strong, caring and loving young lady, grew up in the Spain that followed our civil war. The 50s, as you know, were a very difficult time that was impregnated with the dogmas of the Franco regime, a regime that had a very, very special view of what women could do in society. Every night, as he finished the story, she said, Sylvia, my darling, be whoever you want to be, do whatever you want to do in life, but remember these three things. Be independent, make a difference, and always choose the right thing to do, especially when the right thing is always the hard thing. And so that is exactly what I promised her I would do, and that's what I'm here for. I have been really struck by the narrative that we're using to describe the challenges of our workforce when it comes to the advances of technology. We're constantly focusing on the worst case scenario. We're using fear to describe the future. We often hear statements such as 50% of today's job could be replaced by artificial intelligence in 10 years. Earlier today, Gregor said 10% of jobs in Germany today could be replaced by artificial intelligence today. He has even made it to a sport. I very recently read an article that said that in 2050, the World Cup, in the World Cup in 2050, a team of robots will be the human world champions. Believe me, I have thought about this long and hard and just cannot see how a team of robots could ever beat the Spanish team. That is what the German team does. <laughs> it appears to me that fear has dominated the perception of the challenges that come along with the 21st century. And, and while this is human, I don't think it's the right thing to do. I am here to change this narrative and to offer an alternative for how we help redefine employment as we know today. I think this is probably one of the hardest challenges that we have as a society, but still looking for a positive future is the right thing to do. So, as a management consultant, I have been trained to challenge the status quo and to think about finding solutions to very complex problems. As a woman, I have perfected, perfected the art of discussion and almost disagreement. So, so I started to think about the future of work, right? And, and did what I do when I want to find information nowadays. I Google. So I Googled the future of work and I found 1.5 billion hits. And so I thought, well, you know, it's going to be easy. Um, with all that has been written and published about the future of work, there surely has to be an answer on how technological trends impact me today and what I do. The answer is no, there isn't. So I started doing a little bit more sophisticated research and I spoke to a lot of different you know, mathematicians, philosophers, I spoke to economists, and I read everything that has been published around how we look at the future of work. And I found that the future of work is often dis described as one of two extremes, if you like, a dystopia, of unemployable, low-skilled citizens who are unable to find a job. This is what the most interesting historian of our time, Professor Yuval Noah Harari, describes as the birth of the unworking class. And I was trying to process this. I thought, OK, so do you guys remember the cassette player? Does anybody know what a cassette player was or is? I, I do, so you know, I may be dating myself, but I just thought, this is as if we were living in a world that had evolved to an MP3s or CDs, and the workforce is like cassette players. So not only are there no tapes for us to play as workforce, there's just no music that we can actually produce. We're not only unemployed, we're unemployable. The other, the other extreme, or the other, the other. Um, um, way of describing the future of work is a utopia, 
a utopia that is built on um, a basis of universal basic income, that is built on artificial intelligence doing all of the work. If you want, this is a world where we are maintained by machines or by the value created by machines, and we have all the time in the world to pursue our interest. Or, if you believe that working is actually innate to the human being, we would actually probably be very bored. So, so, so the good news, I don't think that any of those two scenarios will materialize by 2030. But I wanted to find a picture of the future that was worth looking for. And I wanted to start thinking about alternatives for that future that could actually think as positive. So with a team of economists, mathematicians, strategists, and philosophers, we started to think about how you build these futures that you can look forward to. As you probably guessed, and I think we've heard it earlier tonight, making predictions about the future is really hard. Getting those predictions right is actually harder. So just think for a second about inventor Carl Benz, who once said that the worldwide demand for motor vehicles would not exceed a million just because there wouldn't be enough chauffeurs. Well, I guess that he underestimated women's appetite for driving and skill, right? Because we did do uh, go over the one million. So, you know, I just wanted to say that um, we wanted to build scenarios. And just to make sure that we, made, we didn't make the same mistake or we didn't just underlay too much weight on one assumption, we started playing with variables that we thought could be significant and make a difference um, in employment in a lot of given sectors. And so since we're in Mannheim tonight, let me talk a little bit about the predictions that we use for automobile. So we thought, okay, what are the things that can really shape employment around the automotive manufacturing, manufacturing industry? What are, the, what are the, the factors that we can play with? Um, if you want to think about this, um, it's, it's like having a bunch of gigs or nerves thinking about different what-ifs. So what were our, our automotive what-ifs? We thought one of the factors that can make a significant difference is artificial intelligence. If machine learning is really transformative, that could really make a drastic impact. But if it's just a hype, then maybe not much will change. We also looked at the role that the Mittelstand, um, the hidden champions, can play. So you know they are very important and, and part of the backbone of the German economy. So we thought, what happens if they actually have the capital to invest in technology and, and bring that future forward? Or the alternative would be, what happens if they actually have too tight margins that don't enable them to make the capital investments that are required for that progress to take place? And finally, we looked at demand. So we thought, what happens if there are significant changes in the demand for automobiles as we know today? There is a think tank in California that has basically said that autonomous driving could, could cause a drop in demand for cars, as we know it today, of 70%. So we just played with that. So what did we find? Um, across all scenarios, we found the type of future that I was actually setting out to challenge and test. And so I was, I was thinking about this, and you know, the predictions that we came up with had results like, in the best case, 50% of jobs in automotive manufacturing will be replaced by machine by 2030. In the worst case scenario, that was up to two thirds or 67%. And so I thought about this, I thought, okay, we, we need to be able to think about this differently. We need to actually come up with better questions. So I also looked at, you know, what is gonna happen with the workforce in Germany? by 2030. What are the changes that we can expect to see there? And found that we actually, irrespective of what happens with productivity increases driven by technology, we're going to have a shortfall in our workforce of up to three and a half million workers. And so I thought, well, why are we actually 
talking about this in terms of the job loss, isn't there a conversation to be had about how do we transform the workforce that is at risk or having the job automated and have them fill some of the gaps and the, the, for the jobs that we anticipate we won't be able to cover in 2030? Isn't that a better way to think about this? So think about, think about Carl Burns and his prediction um, around the demand for automobiles. Step by step, chauffeurs came and they lost their jobs as well as driving became mainstream. So the change will continue. I think we have all established that and can accept it. But the question is, how are we going to define the conditions for that change? How are we going to drive and create those futures? So what I want to do tonight is share with you four ideas, if you want, four shifts in perspective that will help us create a better, a positive narrative about the future of work and help us tackle some of these questions. So here's the first perspective shift and one of my favorites. And, and you can think about these perspective shifts as changes in the way that we talk about things. So today, our conversation is focused around the robot will replace the human, and that is a scary and bad thing. What well, as I think we could talk about, what are the kinds of things that humans and robots could do together? I have, I, I call this the augmented humanity scenario or perspective shift. And I think if, if I look at what's happened over the last 15 years, I think we have continuously experienced bits of automation positively, personally, I have long enjoyed looking good while my car packed itself. I actually think everybody else in my car did as well. So I, ca I can barely wait for autonomous driving or, or autonomous cars to really take on so that I can use the time that I spend behind the wheel to do other things that are more productive for me. And this is probably going to be safer for everybody else as well, right? So. Our ability to accept as positive the parts of our jobs, parts of what we do, will be most effectively done by artificial intelligence, algorithms or robots, is actually key for this transition. I think working with AI would actually enable us to explore new territory, and that's a huge opportunity. We could start thinking about tackling things like climate change or eliminate disease. And I think there is a huge opportunity around this. So let me talk about the second shift, which is also a really interesting one. As a society and organizations, we value expertise and skill set. We value knowledge. I think a way to think about the future would be to think about valuing learning and mindset. I think that while the role of the expert has had its role, and maybe will continue to have it, it needs to be combined with other abilities, or it will create rigidity in our system. I think a, possible, if a positive future is one where we think about shifting to a mindset that enables us to connect, to, do, uh, to embrace broad thinking, to do interlaced thinking, we can no longer afford to treat education as the part of our life that precedes, that precedes work. I think that in order to be able to adapt to the changing landscape where technology plays such a crucial role, we need to continue to, to, look, we need to look at lifelong learning and develop our, our skills as technology changes constantly. This implies also a radical redesign of our education system. So let me talk, um, and, and this idea is connected with the next shift. So let's talk a little bit about our transition, what I've called our transition to portfolio careers, or going from valuing stability in our workplace to embracing flexibility. Our relationship to work is changing. The idea that we have a job for life stayed with the 20th century. Children who are in grammar school today have a 65% chance of working in jobs that do not exist today. We're expecting that they will have portfolio careers where they will have been in 12 or 15 different jobs by the time they reach their mid-40s. Their careers are not going to be linear, they'll be organic and fluid. 
I think that we need to start thinking about moving away from the ladder type careers that we have today to lattice type careers that are organic. Perhaps most importantly, I think employees shouldn't see themselves solely as responsible for completing tasks or filling a job. I think that as tasks and jobs can be automated, human competence, we must focus on these human competencies that cannot be replaced, such as empathy, interlaced thinking, creativity, which is considered as important as literacy. Let me move on to the fourth and my favorite one of the shifts, which is one where we move from short-term profit to long-term value. I think there is a, a type of organization that is evolving, that is looking at their role in the world as one where they think about people, planet, and profits, and not just profits. Um, I can only scratch the surface on this. And so for the World Economic Forum, there has been a number of conversations around inclusive capitalism. Larry Fink, who is the CEO of BlackRock Funds, has actually written a beautiful letter to the CEOs of the companies that he invests in. And he manages about just about $2 trillion. And so I thought that at this point, you might want me to read it to you. So I will just do that. It captures beautifully what I want to say. So Larry says, to prosper over time, every company must not only deliver financial performance, but also show how it makes a positive contribution to society. Companies must benefit all of their stakeholders, including shareholders, employees, customers, and the communities where they operate. Without a sense of purpose, no company, either public or private, can achieve its full potential. I love this, I'm going to read it again. Without a sense of purpose, no company, either public or private, can achieve its full potential. It will ultimately lose the license to operate from its key stakeholders. And so let me wrap this up and say that um, the landscape, our landscape, will have changed in 2030. What we call a robot, our children will call a colleague. If we embrace technology, we can help our current workforce transition for the jobs that can be automated into new ones that we will create. We can prepare our children to thrive in an area of constant change. We create a platform that brings value to the global communities and help us chase the future. I hope that you find that these perspectives, these ideas, are a good starting point to shape our story about the future and create future work scenarios that are worthwhile living in or waiting for. So, earlier this evening, I told you about my mom. I think that the three guiding principles that she ingrained on me were her way of preparing me for a future that she felt would be significantly different to the future that she had, but to the present that she had. Well, I am a mom too. I am their mom. And I often think about how I, how I, how could I prepare them for their future, which is why this topic is really important to me. Those of you that have children may come across these questions often. Those of you that don't have children, well, I'd say that that can change, actually. I went from one to three in less than a minute. And so this, <laughs> I did, I did. So these precious creatures that we have around us, that are noisy, run around, are actually looking up to us for guidance. And while we don't know what the future holds, it is our collective responsibility to create a good narrative for their future. So I came here tonight to tell you that if employment, as we know, disappeared tomorrow, it's our job to redefine it, recreate it, reinvent it. It's our job to do it together and it's our job to do it now. Thank you.